Part 1, Chapter 5, Selfless There was a fleeting pry, unrelatable and creeping around under my covers as my mind lit like a fragile wick. Oxygen flowed through my system, igniting the fire of my soul that grew and grew until my lids peeled open. Hardly awake, I wrestled with this sudden loneliness that always maintained an advantage. Feeling rustic and unable to concentrate, I lingered prone in my bed. Unsure of what day it was, I searched recent pieces of memory for something that matched the feeling in my gut. A small amount of sunlight shined into my window through the treetops, warming my sheets and beckoning for me to sleep just a moment longer. For once, I resisted the urge. I sat up and placed my warm forehead in the palm of my hand. Nausea corrupted my belly, but the thought of food still found its way into my brain, which only served to churn my empty gut with a hot whisk. It took a little more coaxing, but I finally dragged myself out of bed. A bit unbalanced, but lucid. Right now, I endured a searing headache pulsing in the back of my skull. That sensation persisted even as my muscle and bones found their resting place. I got up, dragged my heels, and stood under the open doorframe. I remember now, lying down, peering through the gap while he wasted another night, and I sighed. I was suddenly hit with a keen self-awareness. I looked down and saw my ruffled clothes and stringy hair hanging every which way. The potent stench of my heated armpits was enough to make me red with embarrassment. Thankfully, I had time for a shower. Moving as fast as my sluggish body would allow, I gathered an outfit for the day and fast-walked to the bathroom. I tossed the loose pile of clothes on top of the toilet, I stripped down to nothing and twisted the hot and cold nozzle to my preferred setting. Taking two steps away from the shower, I was now met by my reflection in the mirror. On the edge of the sink below was a brush that I used to rip out any and all knots in my hair. I dragged the brush across my scalp, over and over again until my hair was pitifully flat. Then, I shook like a dog. That descriptor made me sulk a moment, thinking about how Stacy would love to hear me say something like that about myself. With only a slight tremble in my hand, I set the brush down and leaned back enough to open the medicine cabinet behind the mirror. Inside, I snatched up a white bottle with a red cap, an everyday painkiller that I would normally avoid taking, but today was an exception. This headache fluctuated, but reached a peak of discomfort that made this feel necessary for the day. I twisted the broken cap and shook free two gel capsules, then returned the bottle to the shelf inside without a lid. As the cabinet door fully closed, I was met by my own reflection again. With the blast of warming water in the background, I picked apart all the depressing details of my tired face. The purple drooling under my eyes quickly had attention taken by the dry skin on the bridge of my nose. For a girl, I didn't have movie star lashes or nice plush lips. If my hair was any shorter and my boobs a little smaller, I could easily put on a baggy shirt and be a guy for a whole day without anyone noticing. Hell, even as a kid I was a tomboy. No princesses, no pink. Quickly sick of my own face, I hastily stepped over the tub edge and placed myself directly into the spray. Out of the ten or so minutes of hot water that I was granted, I managed to lather and rinse successfully, but only just so. As the last sud slipped from my hair and skin, the water ran cold and shocked my system, forcing me to evacuate. I don't know if it was the shower or the painkillers, but once I stepped out onto the old dirty bath mat, I felt like my head was in a much better place. Now, with gusto, I used a towel. Now, with gusto, I used a towel to dry the majority of my head and then threw on my underwear, followed by a tank top, purple long sleeve swoop neck, and deep blue jeans that fit me nice and snug. Looking back into the mirror, I no longer saw a sad, sleepless, putrid dog. I saw a person with average looks and bright blue eyes ready to take on the day. Fully dressed and wearing a fragile smile, I exited the confinements of the bathroom and stood in the thin hall with a ringing in my ears. The brief period of warmth and steam had set a new standard for my senses, so being out of that space granted me a peculiar sense of smell and sensitive skin. The air that cycled through the house was thick and oily. In a few minutes, I retrieved my packed bag and set my boundaries for the day, 
arriving at the front door with a morbid sense of fleeting levity. School was my destination, and I was going to have a good day if it kills me. Ripping my sweatshirt from the coat rack beside the door, I was off. The anticipation of a new day gave me even more of a jolt as I hopped down the steps and began my short walk to the end of the driveway. The first thing that I noticed making my way past the surrounding wood was the air. Generally damp and smelling of mossy, rusted metal and pine, however, today was pleasantly different. The air that entered my nose was nippy and clean. I zipped up my sweatshirt, pulled the layer of sleeves underneath down to my wrists, and took all that clean air in. I arrived at the road and checked for the bus, but didn't see or hear anything. Two minutes passed me by, and my excitement began to deflate again as my eyes wandered around the trees. While I liked living in exclusivity, a part of me wished we had at least one neighbor. On both sides of the house and for a square mile across the road was nothing but trees and trees. Not even many cars pass by because of the dead end where the bus turns around. As if on cue, I looked to my left down the road and saw a shape emerge from around the furthest corner. It wasn't the bus, unfortunately, but still, I watched it grow and take on shape. It was a large car, an SUV of some sort. As it drew nearer, I shuffled my feet and pretended not to stare, but I kept it close in the corner of my eye. It passed by with a trail of exhaust smell that dissipated after a few seconds. I blinked and watched it go down the road until it disappeared. I exhaled through my nose and looked up at the sky, taking in the blue for a moment before closing my eyes. Outside it was organic and peaceful. Birds called on occasion, a steady wind rustled the leaves and pines all around me, and random twigs would snap as playful chipmunks bounced around the forest floor. Five more minutes went by without me taking notice, and I heard the bus ease up next to me. Caught off guard, I rapidly blinked, acquiring the giant yellow mass that seemed to materialize from thin air. I boarded with a friendly smile and took my seat quickly as the bus pulled away and continued its route. I leaned my head against the hard glass and started to wander. There were many things I did to distract my brain from boring rides. Today, I watched an imaginary guy on a skateboard riding alongside us. His wheels and balance were immune to the bumps and sticks as he kept up and managed to ollie over every obstacle in his way. Whenever we would hit a large bump, he does some flip tricks or an impossible grab. He was a cool guy, fearless and skilled, someone I wished I could be. In roughly ten minutes, my skater boy came to a halt on the pampered sidewalk, and I felt others stirring around me. I looked up toward the aisle. A guy was just standing there, a junior with a large duffel bag. He slid past me, and I took that as my cue to get off the bus. We had arrived. Once I got inside, I took a seat in the cafeteria where all the students gathered in the morning to wait for the rest of the buses to show up and school to begin. I placed myself against a cold, concrete wall close to the single toilet bathrooms, just lazily people-gazing to pass the time. I saw my old friend Needy with his sister, two nerdy twins with a love of board games and role-playing. He was at my mom's daycare for a short time, but kept to himself for the most part. That's when we first became friends, and still talk to this day, but only in passing. I can't remember the last time I saw him outside of school. I saw Stacy sitting with her older brother, Brent. You could tell with one eye shut in the dark that their entire table was snooty, popular jerks. Perfectly done up hair and makeup to match, sports jerseys and a single football for the boys. I don't know how they could get any more stereotypical. Joey was nearby, but I don't think he saw me sit here. His back was to me, and there was a fair few other bodies between us. He sat with a few people, but no one was talking. He was seemingly copying notes between two sheets of paper, and the others were either reading or snoozing. Joey looked tired from here. Maybe worn out is a better descriptor. I know his home life is a mess as well. His mom used to offer to babysit me when my dad worked late, even up until a few years ago. His dad always tried to teach me random skills, and their idea of bonding was always artful or communicative in some special way. I miss their compassion, despite their hardship of financial burden, and their sickly daughter. I miss them all. 
Then my eyes were drawn to a table in the furthest corner of my eyesight. This table seated one student with their hood up and head down. I locked onto them, a fizzling hum in the back of my brain. I stared in somber silence, peripheral vision defocusing and my image of their shape becoming clearer. I thought I could hear words separate from the commotion around me. A secret conversation by only a single voice. I blinked, and the noise of the room spiked in volume. Now slightly dizzy, hunger gurgled in my belly and I glanced at the clock. One minute left. In this final minute, I peeled away from the wall and started walking in Joey's direction. As soon as I passed him, I looked back to meet his gaze, and we both smiled. I gave a little wave and he stood up just as the bell rang. As it did, the sound of table legs scraping with upward momentum propelled the entire school into action. I kept my eyes forward so as not to lose my place and got swallowed by the crowd. Everything sort of melted together after that. I mostly cruised through classes doing my work and participating whatever assignment was given. Unlike earlier this week, I felt somewhat motivated and managed to stay relatively focused. History in Spanish held no place in my brain, and I only really sprung to life by the time Jim rolled around. It was Thursday, which meant Jim came before lunch for me. In Jim, we had a free choice day, like most others, so a lot of kids got basketballs and shot hoops. Meanwhile, I took laps around the court and finished class by throwing a tennis ball at the wall, a favorite mindless activity. Straightforward, only as difficult as I made it, and sometimes this shy girl Luisa would join me in mutual silence. Today was one of those days, and honestly, it was nice. I threw it at the proper angle to bounce it in her direction. She would scurry to retrieve it after missing the first bounce, shyly grin away from me, and then underhand it against the wall for me to respond. We didn't need to talk or make it a competitive thing, just friendly cooperation between two mutuals since childhood. The teacher called a ten-minute warning, so we all gathered in our respective locker rooms and changed. I didn't work up a sweat at all, so a simple swap of clothes and a little deodorant was all I needed. I was the first out, and waited by the door until the bell rang. When it did, I moved quickly to ensure my place in line. Thursday. That means we had the pleasure of indulging in some sweet potatoes and meatloaf. Apparently, it was the head chef lady's home recipe. It was during lunch that my energy began to wane. I got my food and found a table to sit at where I wouldn't be bothered by anyone. Alone and mindlessly eating, I found myself slouching again, feeling disinterested, slowly returning to the thoughts I swatted at all day. All the tiny inconsistencies at home, the anxiety of generally being at school waiting for the moment a bully might pounce. I was forced to inject daydreams as a way to distract and entertain myself. The images that surfaced were mostly nonsensical and forgotten the second I moved on to another random idea. I replayed movies I'd seen recently and replaced my peers in my peripheral with more interesting people. In reality, my food had been consumed without me realizing it, and I was just sitting there, waiting, staring off into an empty space in the room. Not quite full, but satisfied enough to idle. The space where my eyes rested and my mind ignored then became filled with the body of someone walking in my direction. A hand then waved in front of my face, causing me to snap out of it. Yo, Kim, you in there? I straightened out my back and looked past him, then to his face. It was Joey, standing with a big happy smile and dressed in his everyday beanie and baggy clothes. The leather jacket he had always wore looked cleaner than usual. He must have spent some time pampering it. I gave a moderate smirk and upped the pitch of my voice. Oh, hi. What are you thinking about? I could see you zoned out from halfway across the cafeteria. He then gestured for the seat across from me, and I shrugged, giving him the okay to sit. When he did, he folded his arms over the table and leaned forward. Nothing, just random stuff, you know? I adjusted my seat a little and faced him more. Totally. He swung his hand forward and lobbed a medium-sized bag of pretzels on the table. By the way, snag that for you. My expression brightened, but I kept myself at a low level of energy. I swiped them from the table and looked over the bag. No way, you're the best. He smirked. I know they're expensive, and I had a couple extra bucks. 
Thanks, I said as I unzipped my bag and dropped the dense crinkling plastic on top of my textbooks. So how's your day been? He asked. I shrugged. Okay, I guess. Nothing much has happened. What about you? Quiet and productive. That's Thursday for you, I half chuckled, suddenly overcome by nagging guilt. I looked at him, examining the little patches of blonde facial hair and a single freckle on his neck. His popped collar cut into the hair creeping out of the tight beanie, and I could see a little bit of paint on his right earlobe. In my head, I asked him about the paint, but nothing actually came out. I was sullen. It was like just being around him. All the courage and goodwill I collected was sapped away. My expression must have given away my thoughts because his smile simmered to a flat line, then curled up twice as hard as new encouraging vigor illuminated his eyes. Hey, listen, I know this is random, but I was thinking the other day about what I wanted to do for my birthday this year. I tried to amplify my fading emotions. Big number 17. Gotta do something special. Right. So, I wanted to get a few people together on the day before and, like, go to the arcade and have a pizza party. I nodded, picturing him awkwardly playing skee-ball. That sounds good, but why the day before? Well, because the day of, I have to be home with the family. I'm not gonna leave Natalia out. He grinned but the ache behind each word was layered and potent to those that knew. I bit my lower lip slightly and decided not to inquire. Before I could say anything else, he added, What'll I have to do to convince you to come? I looked sharply past him, an inkling of spying eyes, but no one was paying attention to us. I focused on him again and shrugged. It's not me you have to convince. I don't miss your birthdays on purpose, but my dad won't friggin' let me go anywhere. Especially not with you. You say that like I'm a bad influence. You're obviously not. But you know how he is. He literally threatened to bury you for just hanging out with me when he wasn't home. He leaned back slightly, rolling his eyes. I remember that. I've never seen someone so angry over nothing. You're lucky he was sober. The instant I said that, I realized just how bad that would be taken, and his expression confirmed it. Concern. I waved my hand to dismiss it. A anyway, yeah, I'll absolutely do my best to go, but no promises. Well, at the very least I'll see you in school like usual. I continued to half smile. It's a few weeks away. We have time to figure it out. Then came the guilt. Even if it were solely up to me, I'm not sure if I'd go. As much as I want to, well, those painful feelings would shoot to eleven. Even now, I just want to walk away, but that same repulsing energy is equally pulling me closer, like a magnet surrounded by positive and negative charges, being pulled one way, flipped, and pulled another. I shifted from that, and finally returned to the paint on his ear. I flicked my own earlobe and popped my eyes. You know you got something right there. He blinked and mirrored my motion, first selecting the wrong ear and then taking the other when I shook my head no. When he found it, the flakes broke away and stuck to his pointer finger. Oh, shit, is that the only one? I leaned to one side and he turned his head like an owl, moving his hair aside. As far as I can see, I affirmed. He reset and scratched it off, flicking bits to the floor. <laughs> I was painting and woodworking today. Yeah? What are you working on? Nothing you'd find cool. We had to cut a model car from a single block using a few different machines. Each was its own small portion, totaling like 50% of the grade. This car is the other 50%. Sounds like there's a bunch of ways to lose points. Yes and no. Even though we're early into the year, most of us have tons of experience with the tools, so it's honestly an easy grade. Mostly. Well, what kind of car did you do? He licked his lips. I got a really nice looking Porsche, but got too confident and tried making tiny little mirrors. They, they snapped off. He explained. 
Damn, I snickered. Eh, no biggie. I can just glue him back on. You gotta show me when it's done. I'd love to see it. I smiled. Pfft, you don't care about cars. I bet you don't even know what a Porsche looks like. He joked. I scoffed, slightly offended. So? Doesn't mean I don't want to appreciate your work. That's fair. Maybe I'll swing by and show you after school. Your dad's into cars. I'm sure he'd love to pick it apart. <laughs> my smile wavered, reduced to a little curl at the edge of my lips. He wouldn't give two shits about it. All right, then I'll make it cool so he'll give at least one shit. He kept trying. My smile dropped fully. Joey, he doesn't want you there. His attempt to perpetuate a friendly attitude had faltered, and he too joined me in my frown. His, however, was rooted in more obscure rejection. He clicked his tongue, leaning back in his seat more with his arms drooped onto his lap. The bustle and holler of the loaded cafeteria affirmed time wasn't standing still. His tone deepened. It's not fair. I never did anything wrong. She can't treat me like I was never part of the family. No, it isn't, but that's the person he became after everything happened. You're a boy, I'm a girl, and he's a jackass. I stated. It's fucking stupid. Your dad was always so nice to me, and they both loved the friendship we had. Why can't I just go back to that, man? My response came hesitantly. We've all changed. Things just aren't the same. It sucks. He slumped forward again, looking me in the eye, though I avoided his direct gaze. But I couldn't resist. We connected briefly and shared a stoic, silent reach. I haven't changed, he said plainly. The bell took this chance to strip away the building tension. Neither of us reacted right away. I could see his desire to say more, maybe reset and make a joke or dig deeper into our mutual confoundment. My brain fell off a cliff and was slowly careening towards a bitter impact. But he could never see just how much this small conversation tore me up inside. How could he, when I haven't fully experienced the waves of pain yet to come? He stood up. I followed his motion and recovered my bag, slower now than before. This is exactly why I avoid him. We walked together, a small gap between us, but still together. Joining the herd, we moved alongside them until we reached a junction in the hall where we had to split ways. We stopped, and everyone widened around us while we pondered in unison. He spoke first, distracted. I'll, uh, catch you later, Kim. Bye. I responded and turned away. We separated, not likely to cross again for the rest of the day. I still wanted to stay true to my intention and make today a good day, so I counted my blessings. No sign of Stacy or any other bully so far, and every class went off without a hitch. I casually continued down the halls, taking my time and trying to distract myself from everything I saw. As I walked through the hall, I noticed my old health teacher, Mrs. Charleston, engaged in something. From here, I could see her confined to her wheelchair, trying to reach up to a notice board in the hall with a tack and paper. There weren't many people around, but no one was stopping to help. So I approached her from her right side and stopped. Miss Charleston? I announced myself. She turned her head to me, still reaching. Kimberly, how are you, dear? She said strained. I'm good, how about you? I asked, keeping tight to myself. I'd be much better if I could pin this and move on with my day. She giggled. Would you like some help? I offered, keeping in mind the short minutes I had before next period. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. She smiled, handing me the paper and tack, then took a big recovering breath. I took the items from her and stuck them to the board. The paper advertised an after-school club with a way-too-enthusiastic message. Darn Janitor Bailey must raise this board. Seems like it gets higher every day, she exclaimed. Why not have someone help you with stuff like this? I'm sure your students wouldn't mind at all. Are you volunteering? She grinned. Because I might have a small task for you. Walked right into that one, I thought. Sure, what do you need? 
Just follow me. She spun around and retreated to her room two doors down. Once inside, she ushered me to the back of the room. I have some free time right now, so if you could spare a couple of minutes to help me fix something, I would greatly appreciate it. No problem, I said. Miss Charleston was a sweet old lady with a short brown perm, glasses, and a smile that stretched across her wrinkly face. Married for 30 years with two kids and a yellow Labrador named Holly, I've never seen somebody take her circumstance so carefree and joyous. I followed her to the back corner near her desk, and there stood a tall, yellow-painted steel cabinet. She opened it up, and I could plainly see the problem. The bottom shelf had collapsed, and the books had fallen everywhere. That shelf fell yesterday, and I can't bend down far enough to pick it up, she gestured kindly. I see. I don't think it'll be an issue, I stated confidently. I'll leave you to it, then, and don't worry about your next class. I will write you a late note. She turned and wheeled slowly to her desk. I bent down on one knee and pulled all the heavy textbooks onto the floor, creating a neat stack beside me. I lifted the shelf and examined it closely. Nothing wrong with it, however, the little pegs that held it up along... Nothing wrong with it, however, the little pegs that held it up along the walls appeared to be the problem. One of those pegs along the right wall had popped out. A simple fix. I placed the shelf on the floor and searched the bottom of the cabinet until I found the little guy stuffed in the back corner. At that moment, the bell rang and signaled the next class to begin. Aware now, I actually slowed down a little and took my time. I dug out the peg with my fingernail and jammed it back into its designated slot. I placed the shelf on top of the pegs but noticed it was a bit off balance. Removing it again, I checked them all and saw that the peg I had just replaced was a little bent. Luckily, these things were cheap metal, so I just reached in and gave it a little effort to bend it back with my fingers. The shelf was now almost completely balanced again, so I gathered the books and began stacking them neatly and evenly inside. Once that was finished, I dusted my knees and fixed my backpack, turning toward the desk feeling accomplished. She saw me approach. You work fast, a compliment. It wasn't a hard fix. One of the pegs was bent, and that's what caused it to collapse. Make sure you tell your students not to stack too many books on one side, and it shouldn't happen again. Is that all? I'll make sure to pass that along, she said sweetly. She angled to her right and handed me a slip of paper with her signature and date. Here's your late note, and thank you again. No problem. I'm just glad I can actually fix it myself. I took it graciously. Have a good day, Miss Charleston. She curled her fingers to wave, and I maneuvered past the empty seats and exited the room. Stuffing it into my back pocket, I took advantage of my pass and dragged my feet so I could enjoy the vacancy. My thoughts wandered, but I kept my eyes open for anything unusual or interesting. Most of what I encountered were locker doors left wide open. I left them, in case someone forgot their code and wasn't worried about snooping. I abruptly stopped in the middle of the desolate hall, listening, feeling the thin air all around me. The smell of fresh bleach from a nearby bathroom mixed with some lingering body spray held my attention, but that wasn't all. I felt this unease, like the feeling you get when you think you're being followed. But instead, it was as though behind every brick that made these walls was a set of eyes waiting for me to notice them. I shuddered, the lights dimming a little of my perception. Haunted, I kept moving forward and took the next corner a little faster. That's where I snapped onto a shape. I stopped dead and stared in minor disbelief. Standing completely alone in the center of the hallway was a girl all alone. She was facing the direction I was, so her back was to me, but I could see her head turning left and right. Her feet shuffled slightly in either direction, frantic, indecisive. It was plain to see that she was lost, which struck me as weird. Turning to her left a little, I could see her hands connected in front of her chest, holding a piece of paper. She stopped wriggling for a moment and stared down at it, then let both hands fall to her sides in defeat. My heartbeat picked up steadily as my legs unstuck from the floor. Drawing nearer, I debated on just walking on by and letting her figure it out, as we all had to. However, there was something about the way she held herself that itched my soul. Why not help her? I'm already building a good karma streak. I somehow approached her so quietly that she didn't even notice until I was right up on her. Hey, are you lost? I asked, stopping a few feet from her. 
She turned sharply in my direction and stared at me, like a deer caught in headlights. She instantly broke any eye contact that was briefly established and redirected her vision to my shoes. She bit her lip gently, then replied hesitantly. Who? Me? Her voice was docile. I looked past her and behind me. Sarcasm on full display. Well, you're the only other person in the hallway. It was clear by the way she shuffled her feet that she wanted to escape this conversation. I waited for a response, something to indicate she understood me, but she didn't say anything. She just ogled at the slip of paper and seemed to grow red in the face. Do you need some help? I asked again. She looked up, then turned her head to each side, like she was checking her flanks, then back to me, then the ground. M maybe. Okay, I thought. I stared at her with semi-invested eyes while hers were low and dark. I wasn't able to get a good look at her face, but I did examine some of her other features. Her hair was a little longer than mine, no more than half an inch past her shoulders. The color was a shimmering black that appeared to reflect fractions of the lights directly above. The top of her head was pretty tame, but when she got down to the ends around her face, bangs, and neck, the edges got more sharp and jagged, almost choppy. Most of her bangs hung down with the tips reaching just past her brows, except for a small section on her left that was pulled to the side, pinned with a lime green hair clip. Her sides were the longest, proportionately. Just in front of her ears was a section of hair that resembled thin black daggers on both sides which shaped her face, and reached all the way down past her jawline. From here, I could assess her height pretty well in comparison to myself, which seemed to be just a little shorter, though it was hard to tell due to her posture. She was rigid, but leaning forward just enough to fold her arms in front of her chest like a shield. Similarly, her knees were basically joined together, they were so close. She was wearing a gray long sleeve shirt that reached her fingertips. She also wore a pair of dark blue jeans that looked like they had an elastic texture to them. After I looked her up and down and got a feeling of who she was, I exhaled and tried to re-engage. How about we start with a name? Mine's Kim. What's yours? I felt way more awkward now, but tried to sound confident. My name? She paused. Strangely, she then handed me the piece of paper she kept referring to. It was a slightly crumpled sticky note with a few classroom numbers and her name written on it. Every other number except one was crossed out. E-132. After a moment of examining the paper and all its contents, I recognized the number. E-132 was the math room. Looks like she's headed in the same direction as I am. I then focused on the name in the left corner. T- I stammered. Tan- Now I was growing pale with awkwardness, but before I could try again, she suddenly spoke sharp, clear, and concise, but still quiet. It's pronounced Tonski Hikono. I blinked hard. Huh? Ta- Just- Never mind. She whispered. Then her face got beat red. She snatched the paper from my fingers, stuffed it in her pocket, and began walking away. Hey, wait. I took a half step forward. She stopped, still holding herself. It took a second, but she finally turned around, ever so slowly. Her arms still protected her chest and her eyes lingered around my waist. I got to see her face a little better when she snapped at me. She had Asian features, though her skin was a few shades lighter than I'd seen. Her thin face was complemented by her wide, round eyes and bold lashes. She had a small nose with thin nostrils, medium plush lips, and a round chin. Three dark freckles formed an inverted triangle under her right eye, and the skin of her tear ducts was indented ever so slightly. While my eyes wandered, I noticed something else that really caught my attention. Both of her hands were bound in this tight, strange fist now that she wasn't holding the paper. Each hand was identical. The index and middle fingers gripped over her thumbs, with the tip of the thumb poking out from under the middle finger and over her ring finger. It didn't seem aggressive. Tonsky, huh? I think I can remember that. Sorry if I was rude, I said, walking towards her. She lifted her hand up and made sure that the hair clip pinning her fringe was still in place. If it's easier, you can just say Tonsu, she said, not at all commanding. Her voice was soft like velvet, and she didn't appear to have any type of accent, except for a very slight stutter, which I think is just because she's nervous. 
Tansu it is. So I take it you're new here? She nodded. Cool. When did you move to town? I smiled. She still mumbled. Almost three weeks, but today is my first full day. Really? Welcome, I guess. I chuckled. Thanks. A pause. She looked up at me for a second, then away again. You look familiar. My left eye partially squinted in confusion. Do I? I don't think we bumped into each other before. There was this girl on the bus. She threw something at someone who looked like you the other day. A tinge of embarrassment tickled my throat. I frowned. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was me. I rubbed my arm and bit the inside of my cheek. For the record, that girl is Stacy Kingston. Dodge her if you can. I faked a smile. Is she the school bully? Her voice barely registered my ears. Nope, she's my own personal antagonist. I tried to chuckle, but fell short. Then something popped into my head. Wait, so if today's your first day, then why were you riding the bus before? Her lips pinched tighter. My mom brought me in yesterday to see the principal. She wanted to make sure I got my schedule and met some of the staff so I wouldn't be overwhelmed meeting too many people on my first day. They decided I should ride the bus home to see how I felt or something. But my mom will end up driving me to and from school most days. She explained softly. Gotcha. That makes sense. I saw her shuffle again, obviously wanting to move along. Then, for some reason, I was overcome by the moment and initiated an unusual motion. I extended my reach for a handshake. Well, Tansu, it's nice to meet you. I said in a somewhat happy monotone. After saying that, I felt instantly weird. A handshake? Really? What a lame thing to offer. But I couldn't retract it now. I watched her hands with a patient obligation. She squeezed her mangled fingers tighter, and her thumbs let out a loud, wet crack. To my surprise, she ogled down at my hand and let a faint smile creep on her face, before wrapping her grip around mine and giving a fragile squeeze. Butterflies erupted in my stomach, and my eyes widened just the slightest bit. Her hand was indescribably soft and fleshy. It may seem silly, but I fully expected her to swap my hand away, make a joke, or even insult my gesture. I chuckled a little under my breath, our hands released. I cleared my throat. I uh, saw you were heading to E-132, which is the math room. That's where I'm going as well, so you're in luck if you want to follow me. She kept her eyes locked onto the floor, only slightly peering up at me through her bangs. Are the teachers strict about being late? I shrugged. Nah, not really. If you're within a minute of the bell, then you're usually fine. But don't worry because I have a late note. I flashed the signed paper, feeling cool as she examined it, and smiled timidly. With a gesture, I started down the hall and she followed close enough on my left side, the two of us moving at a snail's pace. I kept my eyes straight ahead but tried to shift over to her to get a reading on how she moved. She was cautious to a notable degree, tight to her own body and avoiding the walls at almost equidistant spacing. I never perceived the way I held myself as confident in any regard, but comparing her posture and movements to my own, I was basically a self-absorbed and entitled priss like the other girls here. It didn't take long for me to continue the conversation. Moved here three weeks ago, huh? If you ride the blue bus, then you must live close to me, because that's my bus too. Which means you live on either Molten Road, or Chase Lane, or Red Hill, I listed. She interrupted. Actually, I live on Jacent Avenue. Jacent? That sounded familiar. I tried to place it in my head, then remember the other road past my house, the one where the bus always does its turnaround in the mornings. Oh, I know Jacent. Yeah, that's actually a little past my house. I don't think I've ever been there except for when the bus spins around. It's past your house? But my mom had us introduced to all of the neighbors between us and the main road. I don't remember seeing you, she stated. Well, no, we aren't part of that community. I actually live on Old Route 43, that barren strip of road that connects Jacent to the main. It's just near that old wheat field near the fork before town. She glanced at me like I was joking or playing a trick on her. I don't remember seeing any other houses. 
I tried to clarify. Yeah, you don't really see it from the main road. The driveway is pretty small, and it's hard to see if you aren't looking for it. At least until it snows and the trees thin. She pondered for a minute. That's nice that we ride the same bus, but I won't be on it very much, if ever. Yeah, you said your mom drives you? That's really cool. I wish my dad would take me once in a while. I sighed, trying to keep a positive attitude. The pitter-patter of our feet continued to echo in the empty halls. In this moment of absent words, I observed her feet from the corner of my eye. The way she walked couldn't be more different than mine. Fast and smooth, whereas I was stumbling and swaying. She wore expensive-looking black dress shoes, which made me aware of my old and tattered sneakers. My mind started to go blank. There was a lot I wanted to say and ask, but I couldn't construct a full string of words. Thankfully, we arrived at the math room door. We postured just outside it, and I could see her breathing start to change. Rapid, short, nervous didn't even touch the aura she gave off. I snickered. It was honestly adorable. Here we are, I said quietly. She stared hard at the door. I could see she was examining every detail, trying to memorize its existence and location. Then she turned to me. Thank you for your help, she replied, barely audible. Ah, don't worry about it, I smiled. I took hold of the door handle and pushed it inward. Right away, Mr. Lane gave me a questioning glare, but let it simmer when he noticed Tansu beside me. Kimberly, you know I don't appreciate tardiness. He sounded much more stern than usual. We stood in the doorway and I looked around the room. Everyone was staring, but not at me this time. That's when I felt a tuft of air behind me. Tansu had dipped half of her body in my shadow and was actively avoiding all of their scrutinizing eyes. Feeling the heat from their collective spotlight stares, I addressed him. Sorry, I was helping Miss Charleston with something, but I have a late note. I showed it to him from across the room. He rolled his eyes, then looked past me. Who is that, hiding behind you? I tried stepping to the side, but she moved with me. Everyone in the room began whispering amongst themselves, and I couldn't help but giggle at her reticence. This is Tansu. She's new. I found her on my way here and we got acquainted. That's why we're so late. His eyes opened wide and his demeanor perked. Ah, I was told you'd be joining us today. In that case, thank you, Kimberly, for escorting her. I nodded and took a step in the door, allowing it to close behind us. I craned my neck to find two available seats close to each other, but the only ones available were on opposite ends of the arrangement. On my way over to my seat in the back right, Mr. Lane approached Tansu and ushered her to the front. I sat down and faced forward, only to see her front and center. She was completely flushed red, her eyes directed to the floor and her fist balled up by her sides. She looked absolutely petrified. Class, I want to take a moment to formally introduce Tansuki Hikono. The room was dead silent. I made sure to look as invested as possible, to show her my support, but she couldn't see me. I then directed my own eyes around the room, observing all the disinterested kids who just wanted to leave as soon as possible. But most importantly, I found Stacy sitting three seats ahead and two rows to my left. Thankfully, she was looking down at her phone, not paying any attention to this event. Lane noticed the silence and just sort of shrugged it off. He then patted her on the back and whispered for her to take her seat. She moved slowly to a desk near the door and sat down with as little confidence as I'd ever seen. It was clearly visible, even from here, the trembling. 